again today in the name of Jesus, our wonderful Lord and Savior. It's always good to be in the house of God, and I know he meets with us in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we're glad you're here, and we welcome any visitor that's visiting with us here at Northside today. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in. It's an honor to be able to bring the gospel to you through a medium of radio. And if you'd call a friend out there and have them to tune in that's not listening in, maybe some shut in, I believe we can be a blessing to them. You'd do them a favor and us as well. And we appreciate this privilege, and this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now the tape today will be tape number 269, and it will be message number 8 on the book of Ruth. Tape number 269. Take your Bible today and turn to Ruth chapter 3, page 317 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Now today is my wife's birthday. I want to dedicate this entire service to her. She's been faithful over the years in the ministry. As she was born on the 22nd of February, she and George Washington was born the same day, to the same age. And so today is her birthday, and I hope you'll see many more. We're dedicating the program to her. As I told others, I told them over in Hartwell Thursday night, went over there to ordain a minister. My wife has only missed two full services in the churches where I've preached in my pastorates in the past 40 years. I think that's a real good record, don't you? Two full service in 40 years. You have a lot of women, they think the church is made for just the men. And they don't have an excuse, they scratch up one to sit at home. But women that love God and want to go to the house of God, God will bless them and use them. And she most certainly has been faithful and we most certainly appreciate that. So that's why we're dedicating the entire program to her. You know, someone said our first president never told a lie. And our last president never told the truth. Of course, I might not believe that last one. I think he has told the truth a few times, and I hope he gets out of the messes in now without being caught in a lie, and I hope, I feel, feel like he will. But I'll tell you, the land is filled with lies. Do you know that? People will look you in the face and tell you a bald-faced lie, and you have some people would climb a tree to tell you a lie rather than to stand on the ground and tell you the truth. That's how much they like to do that. And so the devil is the father of lies, and the land is filled with lies. Well, you don't know whether it's going to be the truth or not, but we still have some people that will tell you the truth. And that's the way it should be. Now, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, you in the radio listening audience, if you tune to this station where you're now listening, you can get the Northside Baptist Church Hour. No, you can't. You can get my program, the Northside Baptist Church Hour. was on Sunday from 11 to 12. And so uh, that's pretty good, don't you think? So that plug, I couldn't have said that again if I'd have planned it. Well, you get the daily program at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday, and, of course, the Sunday program, 11 or 12 on Sunday. I want you to pray for me and write to me. You can write in and get a list of our cassette tape. I'll send you a list of 266. And I do have a full set of tape on the book of Revelation, some 26 tapes that we put on here many years ago on the book of Revelation. We'll have this series on Ruth. And you can learn something from these tapes and enjoy the good singing and the music. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Now I want us to read a few verses found once again in Ruth chapter 3. And let's start with verse 1 again. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, 
Shall not I seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, and whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winneth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thee, and put on thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he, has, he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. Thou shalt go in, and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest to me I will do. And she went down under the floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law had bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself and behold a woman lay at his feet. Nothing immoral about this. This is the custom back in Israel. God tells us in the Bible that when God came to his Jehovah, the wife of Jehovah of Israel, then God laid the a covering over uh, Israel. He said, you're mine. You belong to me. I love you. And so this was somewhat of a customary thing to do in those days. And so I want to speak to you today following on on the heels of what I preached on last Sunday. We talked about the harvest been over. Gleaning is done. And now it's time for the thrashing. We're now entering into the day of the wintering of the grain. Now, when they would cut the grain in those days, they would bring it to a certain spot there on a little hill. And then at a certain time during the night, the wind would blow. And of course, they would tread out the grain and try to get as much of the chaff off of it as they could. And then they'd throw that grain up and the wind would blow the chaff away. And that's the way they got the chaff off of the grain in those days. And now they carried this grain to this particular place to get this done. And verse 2 it said, And now is not boys of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast, behold, he winnest barley tonight in the threshing floor. Now he had a threshing floor where this was done. And he owned the field, he owned the grain. And of course he's very much concerned about that with thieves in those days like y'all today. And those thieves would slip in and steal that grain if nobody was watching. And so the owner of the grain would spend the night there with his grain. They would go down and carry the grain to the threshing floor. They'd have a supper. They would eat and drink and rest and relax and rejoice. And then it would be time to retire. And he would remain there, no doubt with some of his servants, with that grain to be sure that nobody came in and stole that grain. And so God's going to bring his true people closer to him in these last days. Now the grain and the separation of the chaff here is a picture of God bringing his true ones closer in and the chaff being blown away. And God's true people will be drawn closer and closer to him as we move toward the end. And those that are just mere church members, they're going to fade away and become cold, indifferent, and backslide on God because they've never been in. They've been backsliding away from God. And the wheat will be brought in closer to the Lord. And so they're getting ready now to get the chaff off the wheat. And this is the type of the tribulation period. Now the religious movements of today will help separate the wheat from the chaff. As we have these religious movements in the land today, all kind of cults springing up. And then as those that know God and those that have a pastor that can inform them about error and about what's happening and about these cults coming on the scene, they will, you will find then that God's people will be drawn closer in and these many cults will drive them closer to God. And you better believe it, there's never been a day when there's so many cults in the land as you'll find today. 
and becoming more and more numerous, God said they would in the end time. The attack of Satan also will separate the wheat from the chaff. It might not be easy for you to live for God in days that lie ahead. There will be more and more pressure put upon the real true people of God. Now you can get out here and put on a religious carnival. Have a religious shindig. and You can get a pretty good crowd and get along all right. But when you begin to stick with the book and preach the word of God and stand for the truth, it's going to be a battle. And the devil will attack you in every way possible to get you away Amen. from the place where the true word is preached and where the true word can be heard. Now the winning is done in the evening and we're now in the evening of time. They brought the grain down to the thrashing floor and in the evening after the sun had gone down and the breeze began to blow, that's the time to begin to win the grain down there. The winning of the grain is done. Today we're coming down to the evening of time. We're coming toward the tribulation period. The winning of this grain here is a type of the tribulation period that's coming up on the earth. And we're right down near the end. Now, I told the people last night, and I'm not saying this from a braggadocious viewpoint, and I don't want you to think I would. I don't want to be ostentatious in what I'm saying. I'm trying to get a point across to you to show you something that you might listen and believe what I say. 45 years ago today, this morning at 2 o'clock, 45 years ago this morning at 2 o'clock, I came in from a prayer meeting. I woke my wife up and I said, Honey, you have a birthday present. She's asleep and she came up rubbing her eyes. She thought I'd brought her a real something nice for a birthday. It was two o'clock in the morning. It'd only been two hours into a birthday. And I said, you have a birthday present. She said, no, where is it? I said, it's right here. You're looking at it right now. Uh, she said, no, wh what do you mean? I said, do you have a preacher for a birthday present? I had surrendered to preach that morning and came home a preacher. And God had called me to preach. And my call into the ministry is more sure than even my salvation. And so God called me to preach and I came home. And I didn't feel worthy and didn't feel like I'd get much done. But I told her she had a preacher. She didn't know what to do with him. But uh, she did the best she could and done that since that time. But anyway, she received this preacher for a birthday present. Now, I said that to say this. That was 45 years ago. I've been in the ministry 45 years as of 2 o'clock this morning. I have read my Bible through many, many, many times. I have studied. I have cogitated. I have meditated on the Word of God for hours. I've gotten down on my knees and started reading from the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and read my Bible all the way through from Genesis on through Revelation on my knees. Not all at one time, of course, to be sure. When I finished reading the Bible forward on my knees, I started reading the last verse in the Bible and read each verse on my knees back with all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. What I'm saying is this. I read my Bible through backward and forward on my knees. That was on my knees. Not sitting down, not lying down, but on my knees. I'm going to tell you something, dear people. I don't claim to be a great scholar. and I don't, I don't claim to know very much. But a man doesn't stay in the ministry 45 years and read his Bible and deal with people and see what's happening unless he learns a few things. And this is what I've learned and this is what I know. We are real close to the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. All current events, the word of God, everything that's happening today points right to the coming of Jesus. It's dovetailing right into the coming of our Lord. And we are right down at the end. All of these terrible 
crimes committed today, alcohol, drugs, uh, all these different type diseases in the land today, and whether you want to believe it or not, this thing you call AIDS is nothing but a curse from God Almighty upon the homosexuals. That's why that God first placed the curse. And a curse couldn't fall upon them without affecting others. Whenever the people in Sodom and Gomorrah became uh, that type of people, God didn't uh, just let them die gradually. He just sent the atomic bomb on them and destroyed every one of them. But now God has put this curse upon the homosexual movement. And of course others, heterosexuals and others, are being touched by it. And, and though the dope addicts is being shot with dope in their bodies, uh, they are also getting that disease. And they have no cure for it. They have no cure for cancer. And they may never have a cure for it. It may wipe out half of the United States of America. It may wipe out of a half of the world. We don't know. We don't know. God's in this business. God is doing this. And God knows what he's doing. And let nobody deceive you. It's a curse from God. You may say, preacher, what can stop the spreading of AIDS? Oh, well, I'll tell you what can do it. Everybody gets saved and cut out that kind of evil business and, and it quits spreading around. That makes sense, does it? How would you stop the drunkards from getting drunk? Quit making the liquor. If they didn't have any liquor to drink, they couldn't get drunk. Well, you stop uh, the fornication and adultery and the homosexuality and lesbianism and all that kind of stuff. Stop it completely. You'd have a cure for it. Take a little time for it to fade away, but that would stop it. But they're not going to do it. We're living in an evil day. They're going to keep right on, moving right on in the hellfire in that type business. Somebody said when they had the funeral for Liberace, he was a homosexual, died with AIDS. That, that old apostate priest said, we're all going to meet again in the wonderful places where we have met before. Well, uh, he just doesn't know the Bible. The place where they'll be meeting is not a wonderful place according to my Bible. The Bible says there's hell and fire down there where they'll be meeting. And that's pitiful. Now, if a person wants to meet in a wonderful place, he'd have to get saved and go to heaven. You mean God won't save a, a homosexual? Yes, he will. If you mean business wants to get saved, God will save a man with AIDS or cancer or, or any other kind of disease, a dope addict, a drunkard, God will save them. God will save anybody that really wants to be saved. But what I'm trying to say now, we're entering into the thrashing time, the tribulation period, and these things are happening. And they're winning the grain down here in the evening time. Now God said for the church to wash herself and make herself ready. Verse 3. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put on thy rain upon thee and get thee down to the floor. Naomi said, Ruth, I want you to wash up. Take your good bath, anoint yourself. Put on your anointing oil. And I want you to put on that beautiful smelling perfume. I want you to get all fixed up. I want you to look your best. And I want you to go down to the thrashing floor because that man down there has got his eyes on you. And you want to look your best. You want to smell your best. You want to be your best. And that old mother-in-law that had already been along the way knew what she was talking about. And she said, wash yourself and anoint yourself and put on clean raiment and get all dressed up and dialed up and slipped down to the thrashing floor tonight. Well, that daughter-in-law, Ruth, understood that language very, very well. And she began to get dressed up. Now, now this is a type of the coming toward the end. The thrashing of the grain here is a type of the tribulation period. And for several time when God's people need to get cleaned up, get anointed with the Spirit of God, Become faithful to God and be our best and look our best. It's right now. Now is the time. The thrashing is old. Jesus Christ is soon coming. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 and 26. Husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse with the washing water by the word. 
God wants his church without spot or wrinkle to wash your water by the word clean and no wrinkle. How do you get dirty? Oh, you know how you get dirty. Water, clean that. How do you get wrinkled sitting around on the stool of do nothing, saying I'll not be moved, sinners going to hell, you get wrinkles in your clothes. God said get the wrinkles out. Don't sit around, get your clothes all wrinkled out here in the world and get all dirtied up. He said, I want my church without spot and without wrinkle. In Old Testament times when the high priest would go into the old tabernacle, he would, first of all, he would take blood and kill a little animal at the altar and shed the blood. Then he would go to the labor made out of the looking glasses of the women. They had those golden brass looking glasses and they made the labor out of looking glasses and they had water in the labor. This was in the Old Testament. They had to get ready. He had to get ready to go in to the very presence of God in the Holy of Holies. We are fast moving toward the presence of God. I mean, being with the Lord. Whether you believe that or not, there's ever a time when you need to spend some time at the labor, at the looking glasses now. And God wants us to do that very thing. And she said, go wash yourself, therefore, and anoint thee. If you read Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, the Bible tells us there that we put on an, our own wedding garment. That is the type of work we do for God is somewhat the type of the wedding garment we're going to have on at that time. It has nothing to do with the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, but it's our works for him and our service for him upon the earth. Put on the wedding garment. Now notice the place of the thrashing floor. Now this is where David numbered Israel. I've been there many times. Plan to go there in, uh, before too long to the same spot. Now this is where David called uh, Joab his general and said, We want to number Israel, all the young men in Israel. Joab said, uh, Sir, said we shouldn't do that. David said, We're going to do it. You do what I tell you to do. And Joab was very reluctant to do it. But he went out at the command of the king and numbered Israel. And when he numbered Israel, God killed 70,000 of those people. Now, why did God kill them? David made a terrible mistake. I mean, he made a mistake. The Bible said when you come to number the young men of Israel, they are to bring with them a half a shekel of silver. And when they bring that in, they can be numbered and counted. And that silver is a type of redemption. And they failed to bring the silver in. And they were numbered without that. And God said, killed 70,000 of them according to the word of God. Now that was the atonement money and so forth. You can't make it without the atonement. You must believe that. Now we find here that this man, uh, uh, Boaz, is a type of Jesus Christ. And of course, he, he loves God, and he's fallen in love with Ruth. But here, where he's having his thrashing taking place is on top of Mount Moriah. And it's the same place where David numbered Israel. It's the same place where Abraham offered up Isaac. Now, you remember Abraham offered up Isaac on Mount Moriah? And there, he, when he offered up Isaac, you know what happened? Wonderful message in what he did and how God came to his rescue. Not only is it the place where Abraham opened up Isaac, it's the place where King Solomon built the most beautiful and magnificent temple that's ever been built in Israel, right there on that ground. He built that beautiful, beautiful temple. Not only that, but it's a place where another temple will be built during the tribulation period, if not before, where the Antichrist will enter into and sit down in that temple and say, I'm God, and turn against the Jews. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it tells you there, the man of sin, the Antichrist will enter into that temple. Now that temple is not there now. The mosque of Omar is there, but there's still enough land that the temple could be erected near the mosque of Omar. Those Jews over there are praying and hoping God will send a tornado and tear that mosque down. The mosque of Omar is the second largest 
place of Muslim worship in the world. And if they tore that mosque down now, they'd have trouble on their hands. And those Jews are wondering how in the world are we going to get that mosque moved from there? Well, it'll work out. They may come an earthquake and split the ground and destroy it. It'll be worked out. But there will be a temple built there. That Antichrist will move into that temple. And he'll say, I am God, the attorney against the Jews. And after he sits in the temple a while, there's coming a great earthquake. And that earthquake is going to destroy that temple. That temple will be destroyed. And then during the early years of the millennium, the temple Ezekiel tells us about in the book of Ezekiel will be erected. And it'll be a most magnificent building. That'll be the great temple where Jesus will meet with his earthly people during the millennium upon the earth. That time will come and it will be built right there. And so we find here that, that that's going to happen according to the word of God. Now we find that this woman goes down to the house, to the, the hill rather, where the thrashing is to take place. And something very unusual happens. I won't have time to get into it, but it's, it's very wonderful. Great prophetic truths, practical truths found here when Ruth moves down to the thrashing floor and she watches. She doesn't go in. She doesn't show herself. She kind of stays hid and it's nighttime and those men are eating. They'd worked hard all day and now they thrash the grain and it's time for them to get their rest. And she spots Boaz. The man that had taken a liking to her, the man that owned the grain, the man that owned the thrashing floor, and she spots Boaz, and she keeps her eye on him because Naomi said, you watch him, don't let anybody see you, and you watch him and see where he lies down after he finishes eating. And the Bible said they ate, they drank, they were merry, and then it's time for everybody to turn in and get a rest. And so we see here that Ruth is watching. She's kind of hid in the background. She has on a veil and her black clothes. And she's, she's hid there, but she's peeping. And she sees where Boaz lays down to get his rest. He lays down to get his rest. Lo and behold, it's not long until he knows there's something there near him. He feels something at his feet. Ruth slips in and she uncovers his feet and she lays down at his feet. And he realizes something is happening. And the Bible said he turned and lo and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Now watch that type, will you? That's a picture of Jesus coming in the air at the rapture. When Jesus comes in there, when he turns... He's going to look and the church will be laying his feet, brought up off the grave, out of the grave and off the earth and will lay at the feet of Jesus in the air. We'll look into that more closely next week. That's something for you to cogitate on how that is a type of the rapture when Ruth goes in and lays down at the feet of Boaz and he turns and a woman lays at his feet. So you keep that in mind. That's, that's a rich thought. You need to be thinking about it. Now, if we are here today, having someone with us that's not saved, if you'll come down here and get saved, it'd be the greatest thing you'd ever do. If you're backslidden, if you come back to God, be wonderful. If you want to join this church, we receive members, you may. And I hope that you'll obey God and do what God would have you to do. Let us all stand to our feet, will you please? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we pray that you'll use the word, that you speak to thy people. Thank you for the hope we have of the future that we find promised in the word of God. And we pray for any unsaved, anyone here today that's not right with thee, we pray for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Debbie's going to meet. Uh, Tammy Tracy, I'll get it right after a while. Tracy's going to play for us. 
And as she plays, there's somebody here that needs God or you're backslidden and want to come back to God, closer to God, join the church. While she plays softly on the organ, I want you to come. Just walk right down here and do business with God. You'd be glad you did. While we wait. Anyone? Last Sunday night we had some good services. Had a young man saved, joined the church. Another man joined the church. Wonderful service last Sunday night. We're going to have another good one tonight, I'm sure. God may be speaking to somebody here today. How about it? 